Today I want to talk about this, um, sustainability in digital product development. Um, I want to talk about our responsibility as people who are creating products to create things that actually matter. It's Friday today and uh, you might have seen and heard it in the news the last couple of weeks and also today a lot of students um, and, and pupils went to the street to protest for more action in, in the area of climate, for more action from the people who are in positions to, to make important decisions. And I think they're right, because this generation is the generation that's gonna be most harshly affected by the things that are going on right now and that have been going on. And the people who are really like in positions with a lot of power right now, most of them are not gonna see the, the most severe effects of this. So there's a generation question here as well, and I'm, I'm really supportive of what they're doing. Um, I think it's really important, and I think it's important to raise awareness um, because actually we do have a problem. We do have a pretty serious problem. We, I'm focusing on climate here. We have to stay within 1.5 degrees of increase in temperature. That is super, super important. I, I, for a long time, it did, I didn't really get this personally because I thought, okay, well, if it's two degrees hotter, if it's like 20, not 18 degrees, that's not such a big deal, right? I'm, I'm still fine. I'm not, I'm not gonna die or anything. But if you apply that average increase to the climate, really severe things actually start to happen. Even if we stay within 1.5 degrees, big parts of Northern Africa and the Middle East are gonna become uninhabitable by the mid of the century, so by 2050. So even if we stay within that threshold, there's gonna be heat waves there in the summer that are, make, make it basically impossible for people to, to live there on a continuous basis. So that, that already is like really, really strong. And the big problem happens if you go over 1.5 degrees, there is these feedback loops. So what happens is, and one very known one by now, is the Arctic ice. So just make this example real quick. The Arctic ice reflects a lot of the sunlight because it's white, so it reflects sunlight, it reflects heat energy. If it melts, less of that sunlight is reflected, more heat energy stays within the planet. It's a self-propelling effect. And by now, we know about four, five, six major effects like this. So if we go, beyond 1.5 degrees, it's gonna become like a self-propelling thing that we might not be able to stop anymore. So it's, it's really dangerous. And even to, to manage to do that right now, so the, the way you measure greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is parts per million, right? Right now we're at 410 parts per million for CO2. That's the highest it ever was in 800,000 years. And we really have to draw that down. So by 2030, we have to go about 40% below the level of 2010. 40% less emissions than 2010, if we wanna stay within that range. So it's, it's really kind of urgent. It's not like 20 or 30 or 40 years anymore. We have, depends how you calculate, between nine and 12 years to fix this. Otherwise, we're gonna be on a track that is going to lead into a very, very serious thing. I don't want Earth to look like this 2050 or uh, in like 80 years. And right now, if we continue on the path we are now, we are on the track to an increase of three to 4% increase in temperature. And that, and there's like serious scientists out there that, that agree that there, there, there are scenarios that if that happens, we might have a population of 200 million people still surviving on the planet. Just like try to picture that. What needs to happen that we go from the amount of people we are now to 200 million. I don't want that scenario to happen. And I don't want to be stuck on a track where I cannot change it anymore. So if you want to look it up, there's, for example, the um, Institute of Population Science in, in Berlin, Dr. Rainer Klingholz, he, he made that scenario. And it's, it's not like some wild scientists out there. It's pretty accepted that if we stay with the emissions as they are right now, we're gonna have population scenarios like that. I know it sounds pretty dramatic, that's because it is, right? And planet Earth will be fine, it will cope. Who will suffer are we as humans and a lot of other species. So 
we should keep that in mind. I'm focusing on climate because it's the most direct and most urgent, most threatening thing right now, I think. But you're familiar, most of, these are, of, most of you are familiar with these ones by now, and climate plays a role here. But actually, all of these problems tie into each other. I think that's important to remember. So these are the sustainable development goals. They're a really good framework if you want to think about how can we work on things that really matter for people's lives. And the interesting thing is, if you focus, for example, here you have climate action. If you focus on one of those and you do it right, you usually touch many, if not all of these, in a positive way. So that's what, for example, is happening with Ecosia's tree planting. So we're not only focusing on this, we're actually also helping with food security, we're helping with income, uh, we're helping with education. So we have tree nurseries next to schools. So we, the children are taught why it's important to take care of the land and of the trees. Then they take the saplings to their families. There's a much closer con connection to the trees. And so they, they care about caring for them. And we're also supporting schools in that way. So there's like, usually if you do it right, you're able to help with a lot of, of these things by focusing maybe primarily on one. But right now I'm focusing on climate because I think that's the most urgent and most critical one right now. What you do as individuals matters. I think we waited for quite some time to have organizations, politicians, political parties, intergovernmental organizations to fix it kind of top down. I personally don't think that's gonna happen anymore. I think it's up to us as individuals to take action and to fix it. For me, there is no such thing as the system. We are the system. We as individuals and our actions make the system. So I, I, I strongly believe that there's a, a bottom up way like the pupils on the street. Um, and for me, the really good news is, you know, you have a lot of power. I don't know your salaries and I don't know your education, but I'm pretty sure I am, I'm bold enough to make the statement that you are in the top 5% worldwide when it comes to both available income as well as education, just by being here. Top 5%, think about that. You have more influence and you can bring more weight into change than 95% of the people on the planet. That is a lot of power, but with that power also comes a responsibility. So I think we, as individuals, we either have a choice to be part of the solution or be part of the problem. And I think we have an individual ethical responsibility. The good news is you also have, as people working in product, you have really good ways to make a positive impact. So I, there's three dimensions to this positive impact that you can have. The first one, is what you do as an individual. I don't want to focus too much on that um, right now, it's, but it is about the personal life choices that you make. And these are what it says. These are your personal life choices and everyone has to find their own way. But I want to encourage you to try one thing because often this is seen as, you know, you have to give something up. You have to reduce, you have to consume less, you have to give something up. But actually in a lot of ways, I think this can also be seen as you, you gain something. To make one example, do little experiments, for example. So you could say, if you take your, your car to work every day, you could do an experiment for a month um, to take the bike once a week. One day a week, you take the bike, you try it out, you, you see how it feels. And it might not work for you, don't do it, stop. But it might actually, what might happen is that you discover spots around where you live in your area, you, you find a cafe, you find a park that you might have never discovered otherwise. It might be that you feel healthier because you spend time at the, in the fresh air moving your body. So I think it's, it's good to kind of approach it with not what are the huge things that I need to change in my life. It's, it's good to approach in a way, what are little things I can try out and learn from it? Same, I think you've heard about that mindset already a bit over the last days. But that's what we do as individuals. What I want to focus on is what the impact of the products we're building is. So there's two things here. One is the direct impact of the products we're building. The web has in itself has a huge impact. So if, if, if the web, the internet would be a country, 
it would be the third largest electricity consumer in the planet. So often it's, it's really intangible, right? I load a website, I use an app, but there's actually also a carbon footprint on that. So we consume energy and we emit CO2. For searches, for example, really hard to calculate, but, and it depends on the energy mix on, of the country and so on, but it's between half a gram and two grams of CO2 per search. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if you know how, how, how much people search, it adds up. So there is a carbon footprint and there's also uh, maybe an impact on waste, on other environmental factors, on other factors on the sustainable development goals directly from the products you're building. And the good news is you can, you can make a lot of positive impact there. So we as Ecosia, for example, we're running 100% on renewable energy. There's a lot of levels there, like you can buy CO2 certificates, okay, but not so great. Um, what we did is we actually built a photovoltaic system. So we're like, okay, we want to add more green energy to, to the grid. Let's use some money. You can actually make an investment. You can earn from it. It's great. And we're also encouraging all the partners we're working with to do the same. I recently read, it's amazing, a lot of web servers run on PHP, right? And I think that's also something we don't really want to hear about, but it's the truth. Um, and someone did the numbers and if you would, just 50% of them, you would upgrade from PHP 5 to PHP 7, you would save $2 billion of energy costs per year and 3.75 billion kilograms of CO2, just by upgrading 50% of the service from PHP 5 to PHP 7. So it might be a good idea to upgrade your PHP service if you're running any. Um, this, just trying to give some examples here, how small changes can have a huge impact. And it actually ties into what is good UX. If you take things away from your product that are not necessary, it makes it lighter and faster. It makes it more convenient for your user and it decreases the footprint that they are having. If you make your website load faster, you're, not, you're usually increasing retention rate. It has been proven again and again that a faster product means a higher retention rate. But at the same time, less data is being shipped through the internet, so less energy is being consumed. So there are a lot of ways how you can actually improve your product and improve the environmental footprint of your product at the same time. And if you keep that always in the back of your head while you're developing products, then I think you can find these little really interesting ways to do it. And there's a third dimension, which I think is, is really the most exciting one. Because actually, beyond the direct environmental footprint of your products that you're building, they're, they're having an impact on people's lives, right? So you wanna improve people's lives, so you're obviously striving to have an impact on people's lives. And so the products have a very direct impact there. I, I got really angry recently. I read an article that the, the big tech companies, so it was um, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, I think, they recently, like over the last year or so, they made multi-million, in some cases, billion dollar deals with the oil and gas industry. So they're, they, what they want to do is they want to take their server infrastructure, their cloud infrastructure and tools and their AI technology and sell it to the oil and gas industry. I think the last thing the planet needs right now is an advanced AI that can find more gas resources because that gas needs to stay in the ground. I think what we don't need is very advanced drilling rigs that are connected to each other, can speak to each other until their sensors get drowned by the sea level. So I think, you know, it, it's really not a good idea to use these modern technologies to promote something that puts us all in danger. So, so I think that is a bad example. There are really interesting good examples as well. For example, Nest, they have, you know, Nest, the, like home devices, smart home devices, they, they, they show you a green leaf when your, your heating is set up to save energy. So you have a, like a very slight in, incentive to save energy and emit less CO2. If you think about printing, a lot of, I don't know, personally would really try to avoid it, but people are still printing emails or printing things um, from their um, machines. So if you had a smart print tool like built in Mac OS, for example, that would automatically scale down if, if it recognizes there's this one more sentence on the last page. 
you can just scale it down to 95% automatically, you save a page. Think about how many million pages that would save per year. I didn't do the numbers, but I think it's definitely in the millions. So there's, there's all these little things that you can do. Um, if, if you think about how can I make it easier for people to make sustainable choices. That's what we're also trying to do at Ecosia. So our strategy for search is how do we make search more meaningful to people with like sort of the environmental, the green focus. We can give them information that makes it easier for them to make sustainable choices. So for example, if you are looking for flights, well, we, sometimes we all have to fly still, but maybe we can promote direct flights instead of flights with stopovers. So it's already a bit better. So we're going for, you know, a bit better instead of perfect. And that allows us to make, to make these steps and to give people information that makes it easier for them to make sustainable choices. If you, I don't know, if I were the product, head of product for Google Maps, I would absolutely think about promoting bike travel where it makes sense. You know, you have all these smart algorithms, you can build it in. You don't have to patronize your users, but you can empower them to make more sustainable choices. So I think you have really strong ways as people working in product to not only make the, the footprint of them smaller, but also make them useful for people in that way. Something I often hear when I talk about this is, well, but no one really cares and we need to make money. Or one of those two, or both of them. Yes and no. So I think one thing that became very clear to me is others do care. I think I'm a little bit in a bubble. I acknowledge that. But I can tell you there's a lot of people out there who are thinking about these things. When we get job applications, there's a lot of people who are saying, you know, I do want to make a difference. And that's why I'm looking for a new job. Um, when we're talking to other companies who are, for example, also B corporations, there's so many of them who are thinking in that way. When um, we talk to partners right now in the travel industry, yes, they're all about making money and the bottom line and the shareholders, but usually there's at least in a huge company, there's a small group of people who are actually working on pilots for sustainable travel. So there's always, always these people who are thinking in that direction and we want to encourage them. So if you feel like that, keep in mind there is people out there that really do care. I think it's really important to find ways to transcend these perceived trade-offs. And I tried to hint at that a little bit already. So good UX actually often goes hand in hand with a positive impact on people's lives. So I would encourage you to start a conversation. Like what, why are we building this product? You know, you can, you, 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 you want to ask a lot of questions. Um, often you might be in a meeting and you're discussing a feature and the priority of that with stakeholders. And the kind of the elephant in the room is that we're making, you're building it to make more money. Well, then you can uh, at least put that, try to ask questions that allows us to put that honestly on the table. And then we can start having a conversation about, well, is it also benefiting user, users? Um, let's be honest about that. And if we can validate that it is, um, then you can put assumptions on the table, right? You can be like, well, we think it's benefiting users, but that's an assumption. Okay, let's try to validate that assumption. And, and usually the beautiful thing is, I think I have that here. If you, if you really look for the long-term user value, you already usually automatically are doing the right thing. That happens to us a lot. So if, if we say, okay, we, we want to do something that is actually a long-term value to the user, then we are already building the right thing and we're not harming the environment. Because um, how can I make a good example? For example, if, if we want to um, show a, lo a lot of um, news to the user because I we think that will increase retention, um, we have to actually find out does, does it actually do that, right? And if, if we find out it does increase retention, then we should do that, but if not, then we should for the, look for the long-term user value where it's make, maybe actually more about um, finding the right points in time to give users these messages. And you can decrease the scope of your product, you can put in less effort, and you're, you're finding the long-term value. So um, same thing with the big picture, right? If you build something for a small group of users, you don't have a lot of users yet. Um, if you think about would that also work if we put it in front of 100 million users, what would happen then? What would they do? Would that be good for their life, for the planet? 
if you ask these questions and think in that way, or if you also look at the big picture in terms of time over a long time, what if a user uses this for 10 years of their life? Would it actually make their life better? And then if you honestly have these conversations and try to have them and ask them, um, it, it really helps. Working towards the, the right metrics does as well, right? We, I think a lot of companies were really focused on retention, for example, but maybe in some cases we actually want people to not use our product and do something else with their lives. And I think having an honest conversation about that is actually um, an advantage, a competitive advantage. So I think that's really important to keep in mind, right? If, if you are in it for the long run, like maybe the other way around, if you just want to make quick money and an exit, I think it's really difficult to have these conversations. So then you maybe should start looking in other directions. But if you're in it for the long run, then you automatically have a competitive advantage if you're trying, if you're working towards the long-term user value, because it will put you ahead in the long run. So um, I think that's really important to keep in mind and that really helps to, to ask these questions, to have these conversations and to try to see people, you know, what are we working towards and what's the, the long-term perspective here and take the time to have these conversations. The last thing I want to mention is it just feels right. And that's really hard to convey. Um, you know, I think we all know that product management can be a pretty tough job. We have a lot of interests. We often don't have a lot of um, authority, formal authority. It can be a really, really tough job. So I think personally, I would rather put my time and energy into something so tough when I really, you know, feel like it makes sense in the end of the day. So for me, this job that I'm doing now, you know, finding a tough challenge and working towards a deeper purpose makes a difference for me when I get up in the morning. I still have these mornings where I'm like, oh God, you know, I just wanna, you know, take the blanket, but it's less of that. And it makes it easier to go maybe through a tough negotiation with a stakeholder and feel really exhausted afterwards because I know I'm, I'm putting all that energy in for the right reason. It also makes a difference to your team. I find people to be a lot more passionate if they know what purpose they're working towards. And it's really hard to, to show that. I, I, I cannot share that experience with you so, so well. Um, I'm gonna give it one try in one way, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really important to keep these things in mind. Um, that it actually makes a difference in everyday job and in, in, in your everyday job. Um, I want to show you one very short video um, that maybe helps it helps to explain what I mean a bit better. I know the group didn't talk on any not doing no loop here, even near Mara Tetu. Manga can cantaka, the bandian cotto for a clutter. Nears Manka you, me and cotta elta, no more my in your curtain milligan curry. M bans rira, and yaki and tint, and darn de you in via, and quam polar, and so what is zanka and yen vega quanta, ne, and then to two red, yet in titty at the air. The <laughs> And I did Bellanito, I may call my will. By one by school time, I am here. By not try, I am here. By chance, I am in the new dream. Miss Abunto Tonkoto, go and the two about on to school in it. Teacher two was only go back, so quaint or quaint.
a koneri koneri tani rani baba jiga tani tani kudo ni ba yamba barba kon bantu na braga batu toba luru ba iba oro bangar ba mo na nangar ba mo yi pina yalo daba no we duku yidu vidi tunga yiru ba sebu kona na kwefa fi kon tuu zudu ba ona na ni sebu kona ma kon mari yulo kon ma ma ba zudu duba sebu kon zudu ga kon kolongato duba ovre ya wara zuma. Grup ini lana obeh angguan. Nabil nandu apa mereka jom masai. Anak ayah kau mera bapa bapa bujang mera bapa bapa mera masai. Aku nak tanya kau sama. Wei kau butuh ni kau berkoye anak buah bagi Yesus. Ya jauh terus sedih. So ye kau mera kau ye dua mera bagi bapa buat dua orang tu mera bapa. Dia nazar dia baru nak. Dia segera dia curi mana dia curi zeraiu dia curi sebuyu dia nyamu. So kau jauh pulu. In the company, we look at these videos and pictures every like second week or so, every other week. And um, I don't know, I, I can draw a direct line from, I prioritize this feature. I, I see a metric move. We have more searches, more money goes to projects like this and the people benefit. And I can really draw this direct line and it, it makes such a huge difference. Um, I hope you can, you can feel that a little bit. Um, in the end, you know, I, I think I, I said in the beginning, it's okay to try out different things. I, I did the Greenpeace fundraising thing. I failed horribly. And um, that's, that's really okay. And, and I think it's important to try different things. But I, I want to encourage you to, at some point in, in your career, also look at finding something bigger. Something that is bigger than yourself. Something is big, that's bigger than the next app. Something that is bigger than making money. Um, because... In the end, typical career is about, it's about 80,000 hours of your life where you put your time and your energy in. And I think it's good to challenge yourself and to, to find that bigger purpose. And that still leaves you room to try out different things, but it really makes you connect with, with a bigger purpose and finding, finding this path. For me, for example, it is, I want to help to make personal technology and nature and, and, and people's lives work together in a more healthy way. And now I'm working at Ecosia, maybe in two years, I'm, I don't know, teaching how to use IT to children, or I don't know, it might be something completely different, but there is something I feel like I connect to it. And I, I hope it's going to be like this red path throughout my career. And I want to encourage you to look for that as well, um, because it's about so much time of your life and you should try to find something meaningful where that energy and that time goes in. Thank you. and feedback and questions and sorry I went a little bit over time yeah sorry it was inspiring at least after seeing your presentation and now with the strength to go back to my company and really start doing something better thank you well done thank you yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, I think it kind of happens organically. So we, we're trying to apply this mindset of sustainability. So something that is healthy in the long run, also to how we grow with the company. And sometimes we have so much work that it really feels like we need more people. And then we do that. And then we, last year we hired a lot of people and then we felt like, oh, we, we need to slow down a bit and settle. So it's, it's usually we do it like on a yearly basis and we come together as a, as a group and try to get a feeling and, 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 and an alignment on how much we want to grow this year. Um, we have uh, an external goal we communicate, which is 80% of our profits go to tree planting. We have an internal goal, which is 60% of revenue after taxes. So right now we're at about 55 and we're always like, it's kind of like our threshold. We're trying to not spend as more money. Sometimes we might because we want to invest into growing the company or we want to invest into a product. But in the long run, we want to try to put 60% of our revenue after taxes into the cause. 
Um, full time, it's thirty four. One more good example there is actually, you know, sometimes it's really important to update, but on the other hand, try to make your products also degrade gracefully because you might have users that actually purposely don't buy it on purpose, don't buy a new device because they don't want to, you know, have a new device every year. So if you can find a way to make your product products work on older versions as well, with a, not a huge amount of effort, do that because it will help these users. More questions? Yes. So, yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, I, I was wondering, maybe, like you're making more meta at this question. I mean, you don't have to answer, but can you ask me if, uh, with this purpose, working in any big corporation? Mm -hmm. so, uh, example, um, what you're saying, uh, Zalando, or anything that is like eating your food, like the mm -hmm. logistics. Uh, there's this contradiction going between, on the one hand, asking people to consume a little more, but then you're saying, okay, I'm making you know, the, the, the logistical chain better. You know, mm -hmm. like there's less, for example, less uh, returns, so mm -hmm. the retention might be better in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like this. It's, yeah, I, I feel like it's a fallacy. Yeah. I'm going to turn myself on this. There's definitely a tension there. Um, I think in the long run, um, companies who have a purpose beyond making more money will be more successful. I really believe that um, because they, they, and you cannot, for me, Bosch is maybe a good example because they're, they've been around for a long time and they actually have a similar setup than the Purpose Foundation. So there's the Bosch Foundation, which 100% owns Bosch and they do a lot of things and not all of them are great but they still have, you know, a strong sense of purpose and are a big corporation and are about, you know, I think making money per se is not bad. You need to make money to run a sustainable business and we should be running sustainable businesses, right? We don't want to waste money and investment. Um, but I think it cannot be the end. And, and as long as that is the main thing for the, com the environment you're in, you, it's, it's tricky. I think you can still find these pockets and, and work on them. But I think in the, in the long run, it will be also about a transformation of, of more of these organizations. I mean, a lot of them already have great purposes that sound great on the wall, um, but that's what I mean, like asking tough questions. You know, if you, like, if, you, if you ask the right questions, you usually then sometimes realize, okay, actually it is about making money. Um, and then you can be at least honest about it. And I think that for me is the first step in, in a longer process. Yes, what question yeah. from our host in Zurich? I just have to... Um... Hi, Zurich, by the way. Hi. Uh, my question is more on an individual level. Um, so as a generalization, typically what I see is um, that um, organizations or companies who truly do something for our, our, our environment or truly try to help, um, you can usually not pay um, good salaries, let's say, which is okay in many um, cases. But I also know people who, like in conversations, who say, I would like to work for that kind of company, but I have to have a specific in income because, I don't know, they have loans, they have that, what, whatever, right? So what would you recommend to those people who would really like to work for a company that does change the world, um, but maybe cannot um, pay very well. It's a tough one, I know, but that's kind of those conversations. Oh, I can't hear you. Can't hear you, hello? Okay. Ah, yeah. So, um, two thoughts on this. I think one is, I think it's actually better if not everyone tries to move into companies or NGOs um, or nonprofits that that are already have a strong purpose, 
because I think there's important change to, to happen from within other organizations. So I, um, I think that that's maybe even the tougher challenge in some ways. So I would encourage people to also attempt that. Um, the other thing is, I think, as Ecosia, for example, we're paying market salary and we may, made a conscious decision. We want to run a solid business, a sustainable business. We need great talent. So we're paying market salary. It means we're planting a few less trees, but um, I think there, there is no good reason why a well-run company with a strong cause shouldn't be able to be profitable, in, profitable enough to pay market salary. And you might, you might not have a huge uh, profit margin then that you can put into a cause. You don't even maybe have to do that if your product in the first place is, make, is helping with problems, real tough problems in the world, then you don't even need to make a, a huge profit. So, so I think um, I would also look for ways to, you know, to be able to pay market salary. Um, yeah, but it, it's a tough one. We, we have one more thing regarding salaries, which is in some places we feel like the market is a bit crazy. <laughs> so um, for example, I don't know, CEO salaries or things like that. Um, so there, people in the company can consciously decide to earn less, but then it's their choice. And they're saying, I don't need that much money. Um, some do, some don't, um, but that's totally okay. As you say, it has a lot of to do also with personal uh, life situations, children, loans. Um, so we won't, don't want to impose to anyone that they should be earning less. No, that's what how we're can I, What yeah. can you tell them to where they can look for that kind of jobs? Um, there's a lot of great resources. I think, uh, what's the name of the newsletter in Berlin? Yeah, TBD, right? Thank you. Um, so there's the TBD newsletter in Berlin. Um, there's also uh, the B corporations, which are interesting, I think, because they're also in the middle between um, for-profit and non-profit. Uh, I think there is also on-purpose meetups. Um, so yeah, there, there's a couple of resources I can actually, it's a good point. I have a list of links and resources. Um, I'm also going to share this presentation with you. Um, but, um, this is not on there yet. Where can I find interesting jobs? So I'm going to add that there. I want to show you one more thing, which there's actually a pretty new book, which from O'Reilly, which is designing for sustainability a guide to build greener digital products and services. So if you're curious in the topic, um, then have a look now, um, but uh, I have to take it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is also like a LinkedIn uh, question, so yeah. if you want to search for that. Yeah, so cool. yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Thank you. Great questions. Um, I think, okay, I have to pick one. If I had to pick one thing, I would say is, you know, every day zone in on the user value question. Like, you know, ask it again and again to yourself and to others in your team, outside of your team. Because if you do that, and if you do it honestly enough and deeply enough, you will slowly start transitioning into the right direction more and more and more. Um, even if you... Uh, and then at some point it might get to a point where you can have conversations like, okay, great. We added a way to our app to make the check in into the flight easier. Um, that is great. That solves a user need, but maybe actually 
you know, the long-term user need is that these people should be flying less or should be, um, you know, so this is probably later in the stage, but even in the beginning, you, you, if you really zone in on, to, on, on the user value and you focus on that and you try to focus the conversations on that, you will already have these small wins. For example, with um, performance, if you have a persona, which is maybe more on an older device, um, it might be a strong incentive to make, make your application more lightweight um, and to make it more work on older versions. So yeah, the, the user again, I think is your, your most powerful weapon in that sense. Don't make your user a weapon. <laughs> and the second question, monitoring, just really quick. Um, we do have, and that's ah, another good example. We do have extensive monitoring. So we have contracts with the projects and we do have auditing and we do uh, get every month we get pictures and satellite pictures. We do regularly visit them. Um, so I think by now I, we can talk a bit more um, about it later if you want, but I think by now we have very solid monitoring in place. We have one other great thing, which is an app that works on old Android devices that they can actually use to walk around and count trees. So they, because they need to do something like a survival rate. So they usually have an area where they need to um, estimate how many trees survived. Um, so they, they have this very simple app and then it feeds into a database that we can use. Um, so the, these are some things we have in place right now, because I agree with you. Um, it's not just about putting money somewhere. It's, it's a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah, I think there's different levels of ignorance. Um, I'm still surprised how often it's actually a lack of information or, or, or in misinformation. Um, so I really try to first patiently find out if that's the cause of the ignorance. Um, another level or another cause of ignorance, I think, is feeling overwhelmed by maybe the, change, the scope of the challenge or also the personal responsibility, which we all have, I think. And there, I think it's also good to be gentle and to be, you know, um, it's so huge. So, um, and if you really, like our brains don't like cognitive dissonance. So, right, if we, if we accept that there's a problem then, and then don't change, that creates tensions in our brains and we don't want that. And I think you can kind, and then some people stop accepting that there is a problem. And I think you can help a little bit with that if you say, well, you can still acknowledge that there's a problem and maybe do just something very small as a first step to take the pressure out a bit. But because I think that's another reason for ignorance. If there's just blatant, you know, um, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to hear about it for extended period of time. I think it's more reasonable to put your energy somewhere else as well, because I think there are a lot of positive things happening. So I think that's where I would focus my energy. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to give a comment on this one. Because, yeah. um, I think if, if we want to solve such a big issue by telling people, you have to stop flying, you have to stop uh, you have to stop this and this. Yeah. Then it creates like a barrier where I say, but I don't want to change my life. So yeah. then if you tell, and I like you in your example of saying, look at small things that you can do, it's not the big things, it's not like stopping uh, using your car, but it's not exciting to use it only um, or stop using it once a week or so. Yeah. This is something that helps me to relate to an issue like I can do this, I can stop eating for a day. Yeah. Um, so I think this is how you can actually yeah. understand it. Yeah. And reframe it for yourself and others to as an opportunity as well. Because if you say, I have to stop eating meat, it immediately feels about giving something up. But you might actually discover new ingredients. You might discover new recipes. You might discover, I don't know what. So, so I think it's always a chance to discover something new as well, um, as every change is. Um, but that's the personal level. And, and I think that's a very indiv individual thing, how far you want to go there. Um, we, I think everyone at Ecosia struggles with that as well. We have some people who are vegan, we have some people who love meat. It's fine, you know, then there's all these different levels and I think it's important to keep in mind your job is one of them and you can also have an impact there. 
a big one actually. Remember, top top five percent. Yes. First of all, thanks for a very inspiring presentation. I just have a quick question. Maybe you covered it and I missed it, but does a search on Ecosia actually have a lower carbon footprint than a search on Google? Yeah. So actually, um, it, it is negative carbon. It's interesting because so we we have enough renewable energy through our PV system. So it's already 100% powered by renewable energy. But because we're planting trees, we did the numbers in every search you do, if you, so we need on average about 50 searches to plant a tree, if you're like an average ad clicker. Um, and every search you do actually takes out one kilogram of CO2 off, out of the atmosphere because of the trees you plant. And trees are a great way to suck atmos uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere. So actually, by searching with Vicosia, you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, that's a pretty cool thing. I think there's no other easy ways to sequester carbon at the moment. Yeah. I have a question. Um, what my problem with a lot of sites that are doing sustainable efforts is mm -hmm. is that while they tackle one issue, they create a different issue, mm -hmm. or they just kind of shift the problem somewhat. Mm -hmm. For example, um, this is a relatively good example. Okay, solar energy mm -hmm. is, is, is awesome, of course. However, you need extreme amounts of energy to create panels. Mm -hmm. You need rare earths mm -hmm. that there just aren't so many. You mm -hmm. uh, get them out of countries mm -hmm. where working conditions are absolutely horrible. You have like kids working in the mines that then sustainably power your company, yeah. which is not sustainable, yeah. which is not also not ethically you know, great. And we have MacBooks, right? So exactly. Yeah. You were talking about the few devices that live for more than a year that block in MacBooks. Yeah, I don't. don't but yeah, yeah. Is my personal? This is only my personal yeah. problem. Is that nothing is really, really one hundred percent stable. Yeah. Um, and as long as we don't, I don't know, find a way to completely get rid of the CO two in our atmosphere and just like reset the planet. Yeah. Like sooner or later we'll probably die anyway. Uh, so it's 2050 or 2250. Yeah. So like how do we do that? Yeah. I it's it's a valid question. Um so one thing is we're getting better at it. So the whole concept of life cycle analysis is getting pretty sophisticated by now. I'm I'm not an expert, but I already discovered in this book that they're doing life cycle analysis of digital products. So really trying to honestly look at the whole story. Um, that being said, I think for me, it's better to do something better than doing nothing because we don't know what the perfect solution is. So I, that's a, again, a very personal decision, but I, I personally don't want to take this fatalistic stance because the decision I'm making now are gonna affect my life still massively and they're gonna affect the life of when I have children directly. So why would I raise a child that would be so massively affected potentially by, you know, till 2100, um, if I could at least try to steer it a bit in, into a more reasonable direction. So um, personally, I, I, I try to remove this dead block of you know, I don't know what's the perfect thing by saying, okay, I know something that is very likely better and, and small steps. So that, that's how I personally approach it. Yeah. If there's any more questions, we'll skip one more question and then I'll be supposed to do something. <laughs> 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 we'll do a sample. We'll put it around the spot, right? And then uh, that's going to be a short period of time. Thank you so much. For